Amen. As you're taking your seats, I want you to now see your neighbor. Say, neighbor, the preacher's going to preach about taking lemons to become lemonade. Lemons to lemonade. Lemons to lemonade. I share with you all those that were at midweek this past Wednesday. I shared uh, that last week, last Monday, man, my world was just shook. You know, dealing, having to get up early in the morning to take Carrie to the hospital to have the procedure done. I was at peace with that. Then, as we're there, um, as we're there getting ready to prep for the surgery to take place, I, I, I get word that a 30 year old pastor out of California attempted suicide on Friday and died last Saturday, leaving behind three small children, a wife, a mother, siblings, a church, a guy who battled with depression and anxiety for some time. Shared two weeks ago, August the 19th, shared just fresh back, Fresh, fresh back from his sabbatical. Started a new series entitled Hot Mess, just sharing how God can be able to take the messes in our lives and make miracle out of our messes. Preaching through what he's going through. Okay. Up there preaching and teaching, no one knows that he's contemplating taking his own life. 30 years old. Thriving church. Thousands of members. Casting visions to the church about the direction of where they're going. Excited about vision, elderhood. Takes his life and brings it all to an end. I said this on Wednesday. I'm going I'm to continue to say it. I'm going to keep saying it as long as God give me the voice to be able to say it and the mic to be able to say it from. Your mental and emotional health is your responsibility. All right. say it. Okay, I got two folks on that. Let me say it again. Right. Your mental and emotional health must be a priority in your life. It's nobody else's responsibility uh, about the health of you emotionally and mentally. It is your responsibility to make sure that you are the best you that you can be for you and then for everybody else. God, I'm preaching already. Let me say it again. Your mental and emotional health is your personal responsibility in keeping your peace, in guarding your peace, in saying no to certain things. Because all of us, 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 just like Elijah, we looked at this past Wednesday, just like Elijah, we get to a place that we say, I've had enough. This is it. I can't take nothing else. Though he probably said that in his mind, he may not have verbalized it through his lips to catch somebody else's attention to get them to realize that, that he needed some help because he had gotten to a real dark place that he thought that the only solution was to end his life. That's a low place. It's a dark, that's a very dark place. It's a very dark place to get to in your life that you think that, that this is it and that I can't go on anymore, that this is it. I can't take anymore. I don't want to take another step. I have to bring an end to this pain that I am experiencing. Grief, grief is going to be on the screens in just a minute. Grief is not limited to just losing a loved one. Grief is when you experience any type of a loss in your life. Bear with me, church. Let me go. Let's go ahead and say this again. Grief is not limited to just losing a loved one. Yes, you experience grief when you have someone that you've done life with for so long and they're no longer there. But grief does not just stop there. When you grieve, you grieve, you grieve, you grieve, you grieve. When you've been on the job faithful for years, on time, took an hour lunch break. In fact, you gave a minute back, 59 minutes you spent on your life lunch break with a minute left to only get a pink slip and say you've been replaced by technology. Grief happens 
When you've been with the person, been united in the covenant of marriage with the individual for so long, but all of a sudden things are not working out, stuff is not coming together, and you feel that the only way, the only way for you to be able to move on with your life and me to be able to move, move on with my life is for us to go our separate ways. Grief is when you experience any type of loss in your life. And here it is, saints of God. Here it is. Here it is. I want to be able to help us this morning. I really, really want us to be able to help us this morning to be able to realize and to see that it is okay. It is okay for you to grieve. It's okay to allow yourself to be able to grieve. It's okay to go through the stages of grief, to go through shock, to go through, to, to go through anger, to go through not understanding why life has dealt you the hand that it, ha that it has been dealt. The mistake that we make, I'm really trying to help us this morning. The mistake that we make is that we pause and we stop ourselves from grieving because we don't want to deal with the pain that comes along with grief. Okay. Oh, God, we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to deal with it. We don't have time for it. So what we would do is we will make ourselves busy. We will make ourselves busy, extra busy on top of what we've already been doing. And we do things and we engage in things just to keep us going so we don't have to think about it, so we don't have to talk about it, so we don't have to uh, 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 discuss it or acknowledge it. And then all of a sudden, grief will drop down on you and grief will say, listen, I had enough of you. You will allow me to express myself and grief will hit you like a ton of bricks. And if it's not managed well, can lead you down a road called depression. I know, I know, I, I know, I know there's some folks that say that the saints don't get depressed. The saints don't have these feelings. The saints don't have these emotions. I want to meet those saints. I really want to meet them. And, and I want to introduce myself to them. And I want to ask them, have you written a book? on how you've been living life and you've never been discouraged, you've never been upset, you've never been depressed, you've never been dark. I need you to coach me and mentor me on how to be able to navigate through those things in life and never be bothered by it. Oh, but in this life, in this life, we will have trials and tribulations. In this life, we will face some things that will be so heavy, that will be so weighty, that will lead us down a road called depression where we feel as if there is no hope at all. Even though we get to that place, even though we get to that place, even though we get to that place, you need to know and you need to be reminded that though you may be down right now, though you may be in a dark place right now, that is not your final destination. Thank you, Jesus. That is not your final destination. No, 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 no. If truth be told, you are going to experience one of the greatest comebacks and resurrections in your life as long as you keep holding on, as my daddy would say, to God's unchanging hand and never let go of his hand. Because though it may be dark, though it may be heavy, though it may be weighty, even though where you're at and you're down and you're out, God is there at rock bottom. He is the God of the bottom. He is the God of the rock. And right where you are, God will meet you right where you are. I wish somebody would testify and help me preach this morning that, Pastor, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been down. I've been out. I've been counted out. I've been counted out. But at every moment of my life, when I thought I was going to give up, when I thought I was was going to throw it in the towel when I thought this was the end. God always showed up and he showed up and he gave me the strength to open up my eyes and to lift my head up a little bit higher. Yes. Thank you, God. Just to go on. There's insurance in knowing that God is concerned about you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God's concerned about you. God is concerned about you. Come on, tell another neighbor, God is concerned about you. Oh, come on, tell somebody else, God is concerned about you. Come on, reach over and tell somebody else, God is concerned about you. Put your hands to yourself and say, self, God is concerned about me. God cares about me. God is concerned about every avenue, every area of my life. He is concerned about me. I love this story here in this book of Ruth. Many times we see this book and people get excited whenever the preacher preaches about Ruth because they start thinking about Boaz. Oh, God. Let me just help us. There's more to the story of Ruth 
than just Boaz. Because what I've come to realize, some folks are going to get mad at me when I say that, but that's okay. They're going to get mad. Many of us, many of us, many of us, many of us, they get excited when we get to the book of Ruth because we're talking about Boaz. Oh, God. And then the sisters, amen, my sisters in Christ, they get excited. I'm going to find my Boaz. But they're talking about finding the Boaz, but they've never been a Ruth. And they're never trying to be a Ruth, but they're looking for Boaz. Oh, God. Let me go ahead and go. Let me go ahead and get my keys and go to the door because I'm about to get some saints mad. They're looking for Boaz, but they have never taken the principles of Ruth and applied them to their life so that they could be able to receive Boaz and recognize Boaz and not Bozo when he shows up. But there's more to the story of Ruth than it is about you found a match made in heaven. This story, this story is absolutely amazing. So please journey with us here as we get to the story of Ruth chapter 1. It's an amazing and amazing and amazing and amazing and amazing story. Here it is, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, taking care of his wife, taking care of his two sons. And a famine happens in Bethlehem, you have to understand the name Bethlehem means the house of bread. So the place that has bread is deficient of bread, has nothing. So Elimelech says, let me go ahead and be the responsible adult that I am. I'm the male. I'm taking care of my household. I'm taking care of my wife. I'm taking care of my children. Let me pack them up. I'm going to move them to Moab. But there's, there's more to the story than just them just moving to Moab. Here, here it is, saints of God. This was the time of judges where people did what was right. In their own eyes. Okay, come on, Sunday school class, help me out. They did what was right in their own eyes. They were their own law. They were their own judges. And so when they would get in trouble, when they would get in an encounter where they could not get themselves out of minister four, they would pray and ask God to send them a deliverer, and God would raise up someone to deliver them. And then as soon as they were delivered, they would go right back. Following after other gods, worshiping other after other gods, making all of these, making all of these deals with God. God, if you get me out this time, God, I ain't gonna never do it again. Y'all know, y'all know, y'all know. Listen, we're not too far away from them because we do the same thing. God, help me, Lord, help me, help me, help me, Jesus, help me. We pray for God to help us, and we say, Pat, if we say, God, if you bring me out on top this time, God, if you bring me out at 1152, Father God, I'm going to praise you like I lost my mind when I get to church on Sunday. Uh, but God, I'm going to be the first one at church. I'm going to tear the church up. I'm going to lift pews. I'm flipping. I'm going on top of the chandeliers. I'm singing. I'm serving. I'm doing everything that I can do. But Sunday morning comes. The end of Sunday evening comes. And we said, God, you know, you know, Lord, you know, it's, it's Labor Day weekend, Father. I just want to relax before I get back to work tomorrow. Next, in fact, God, I'm going to be at Bible study Wednesday. I'm fasting with the church. We make these deals. We make these empty promises that we have, that we have, that we have no, we have no, we have no cognizance of bringing these things to pass. But we make them anyway. Right. This is what they did. It's what they did. God would deliver them. God would bring them out. And then they would go right back into what they were in. So God is saying, listen, I'm tired of y'all jokers misusing me, using me. Every time you get your back up against the wall, you pray and ask me to get you out the bind. I get you out the bind because you revert back to your old ways. So God shows his hard hand now. And he allows for a famine to hit the land. Elimelech is looking. He said, I got to get my family out of here. We have nothing to eat. We have no resources. Let me go ahead and get them somewhere. So Elimelech takes his wife, takes his two sons, and they go to Moab. They don't believe in God. They don't worship the same God as Elimelech and Naomi and their children. But they go to this pagan land to find food and resources. So they get there. They get to this land. And follow me along. We're right here in verse 6. They get there to the land. Everything is good. Everything is going well. But then all of a sudden, the worst thing that could ever happen to Naomi is that her husband dies. Before, when they get there, their sons go and they marry two more white women. They, two, two more white women. They, one son marries Ruth. The other son marries Oprah. Orpah, I'm sorry, not Oprah, y'all got excited, not Oprah, Oprah, Orpah, Orpah. And so, marries them, 
Her husband dies. And soon after her husband dies, her sons die. So now you just don't have one widow. You just don't have two widows. Now you have three widows that have no covering of a male. And you have to understand, during the context of this time, during this time, it was very, very vital for husbands and wives to have a son because the sons were the ones that worked. The sons were the ones, the men were the ones that made provision. So if something happened to the father, the mother would still be in good hands because of the sons. If something happened to the father, now it was up until the, it was up. It was the responsibility of the sons to be able to take care of their mothers and make sure they had everything that they needed. What do they need to do now? Father Limelech is dead. His sons are dead. And here it is. Naomi, Ruth, and Oprah. Going through one of the tri one of the hardest moments, one of the darkest moments in their life. Let me just use my sanctified imagination. I can only imagine what the conversation must have been like amongst these three as they're grieving. Listen, it's a hard thing to be able to grieve, to grieve, and then, and then have to try to figure out how we're going to make it tomorrow. What is life going to be like after we put them in the ground? Where are we going to live? Where are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? How will we have daily provision? We're vulnerable now. We're widows. Who will protect us from the snakes who will try to come and take advantage of our vulnerability right now? Never, 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 never forget. Hear these things. Never forget that God is at work even when it looks hopeless. Oh, God, I'm preaching already. God is at work in your life even when it looks hopeless, even when it looks dark, even when it looks disgusting, even when it looks nasty. Never forget for a moment that though it looks crazy to you and you don't know what's going to happen next, you don't know how things are going to come together, you have no idea how ways are going to be made. Just know, just know, and rest assured that your father, who is the CEO of the universe, is not concerned concerned about what you're, it's not, it's not shocked, excuse me, it's not shocked by what's happening to you, but he's up there controlling the airways of life, and he's working things together for your good. He is always working on our behalf, even when it's dark and it looks hopeless to us. It's never hopeless to God. Oh God, that's good news right there, that though it's dark, though it's tight, though it's heavy, it's never too heavy for God. So here it is. Naomi has the conversations with her two daughter-in-laws. I love this because, listen, there's only about two times that I counted, it may be more, two times that I've counted where you see a relationship so tight between an individual and their mother-in-law. Peter was concerned about his mother-in-law that he had Jesus come to the house and heal her and she cooked the big fish dinner for him. Here it is, Ruth and Naomi have a tight relationship that Naomi gets, she comes to her senses and she realizes, she says this, you know what, y'all, go ahead and go. You're young, you're cute, you got good hair. You'll be able to find somebody along the way. I'm old. I am beyond childbearing age. I would never be able to have a son. And if I had a son, would you wait for them to get up an age to be able to marry them? So go ahead. Live your best life. Do what you do. Go forward. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. The Bible says that Orpah takes heed to what she said. But before she leaves, there's an embrace. And both of them are crying. Because again, I told you all, they don't know what the next chapter of their life is going to look like. Oh, it's going to make sense in a minute. Just keep rolling with me. They don't know what the next chapter of their life is going to look like. But 
Ruth, this Moabite woman who does not believe in the same God in Naomi, of Naomi, says, hey, listen, I ain't got nothing to lose. I ain't got no husband. You ain't got no husband. I don't know what the next chapter of my life looks like. You don't know what the next chapter of your life looks like. So how about we just wrap this thing out together? Right. Once again, Naomi says, wait a minute now, hold on. You heard what I told Oprah. You go ahead, you go ahead, and you do your thing, girl. You live your best life. You go ahead, and you find you a boo, and you get united and have kids. Don't worry about me. Just go ahead and go. She said, no. She said, no, 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 no. I'm not leaving you. I am committed to you. She said, your God is going to be my God, and your people will be my people. She said, listen, I'm going to be with you until you die. Get this. Ruth is making a long-time commitment. Here's what she's saying. She's saying that where you go I'm going to go where you die I'm going to die did y'all hear that yeah. she said where you die I'm going to die so if wherever you go I'm going with you and when you die after you die I'm going to remain there and I'm going to die in that same place as you and I'm going to be buried right next to you yeah. commitment. commitment that she's making to Naomi her mother-in-law, who's in the same situation as her, and get this, you all, Ruth has one up on her that she could go out and begin to start her life all over again. But she is so concerned and she is so committed to her mother-in-law that she says, I'm not leaving you. I don't care what you say. I don't care how many posts on Facebook you put up. I don't care how many Snapchats you put up. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here with you. So finally, verse 18 says, when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, <laughs> she said nothing more. <laughs> Wasn't nothing else to say because she realized this chick has lost her mind. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to keep pressing her, but I'm trying to figure out why she's committed to me, why she wants to stay with me, why she wants to kick it with me. Because you know what? You, you find out, thank you, Holy Ghost, you find out who's really a part of your squad when you're going through some stuff. Oh, God. You find out who really rolling with them when you are going through some tough times in your life. In fact, when y'all are in the same situation together but they got one up on you that they could go out and start all over again but they stay there with you and kick it with you during your time. All of us need some roots in our lives, male and females that will ride with us who will ride with us. I know folks been asking, Kiki, are you with me? Are you going to ride with me? But I need a root that can be with me and ride with me through some of the dangerous things in life and know yeah. that they're there. Yeah. So Naomi says, I'm not saying nothing else. I'm not going to bug you no more because some, some, something I'm about to pray for you because something's wrong with you because I don't know why you want to stay here with me. So now, now they make up in their mouths. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's go. Let's get out of Moab. Let's go and head back to Bethlehem. So word has already gotten now that, that Elimelech and his son has died, uh, sons have died, and that Ruth and Naomi are coming back, and that Oprah, uh, o o Orpah, Orpah has already transitioned and started her life all over again. So here we are, they get back. People are excited to see okay. Naomi. Girl, how you doing, Naomi? Mimi, how you doing? Girl, this has been so long, you look good. Sorry to hear about your husband. Sorry to hear about your sons. But we're so glad that you're home. Uh -huh. Get this. Get this. They see her, but they notice it's a difference in her countenance. Look at verse 20. Look at the latter part of verse 19. Tom was excited by her arrival. Then they asked the question. The women asked the question. The women noticed everything. They said, Ain't gossiping. And you ain't heard this from me. But is that really Naomi? Girl, she done lost weight. I mean, what's wrong with her? 
I mean, I know her husband is gone, her sons are gone. What's going on with me? She don't look the same. Girl. We're gonna have to pray for her. Call, 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 call Sister Carol until we need to and tell her what happened and what's going on. We need to pray for her. You can have some drastic things that happen in your life. Oh God. That can change your entire countenance. Life can hit you so hard that no one will have to ask what happened. They can just look at you and tell life that hit you. Trying to figure out, is that really Naomi? And she stops the conversation. Look at verse 20. You got to keep your Bibles open here at Hope World because we teach and preach from the word of God. So you got to follow along and make sure I ain't lying. Hallelujah. Here we go. Look at verse 20. Verse 22. Verse 20. <laughs> Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara. For the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has such tragedy upon me? She stops the ladies from talking and realizes, listen, I get it. You're right. I don't look like myself. I don't sound like myself. Life has hit me a low blow. Life has hit me in a place that I never, I never imagined my life without a lemonade. We were supposed to live our best lives together and just go together. I never imagined my sons leaving me. I just knew they were going to, I'm going to walk around and babysit their kids. I never thought life would get me to this place I am right now. Oh, and some of us can be able to say that same thing, that we had goals, we had plans, we had aspirations, and we never thought that life would deal us the hand that it has dealt us. We never thought that life would get us to the place that we're at right now. So she says, forget the name my mom and daddy gave me. That name means pleasant. That name means sweet. I'm not pleasant because life has not been pleasant. I'm not sweet because life has not been sweet. Get this, you all. Naomi is in such a bad headspace that she identifies herself right. with what she's going through. Yes. Go ahead. God, y'all missed that. She's identifying herself by the circumstances of her condition. Okay. Don't call me Naomi. But call me Mara because I'm bitter. For the Almighty has made my life very bitter. God has a way. God has a way. God has a way of changing you and I by changing our perspective. Come on, come on. Let me say it again. God has a way of changing you and I by changing our perspective. Get this. You got to read this. You got to follow along with me because get this, get this. What happens is, what ha what's happening now, as she has transitioned out of Moab into Be Bethlehem, back to Bethlehem, back to the house of bread. You have to understand this. Y'all have to follow along and understand this to, the, to its fullest extent. Life got better for Naomi when she got out of Moab. Because when she got out of Moab, God is using the transition from Moab to Bethlehem to be able to change her perspective about what's happening in her life. Okay, okay let me say it again. Sometimes, sometimes, everybody say sometimes. sometimes. Somebody say sometimes again. Sometimes. sometimes, one more time for the Holy Ghost, sometimes. Okay. Sometimes God has to change our location so that our perspectives can be able to change. Let me say it again. Sometimes God has to change our perspective so that our, God has to change our locations so our perspectives can change so that we can be able to view what's happening in us and around us and through us through the lenses of God. Because if, we, if he does not make the shift, if he does not make the change, our perspective will be distorted and we will miss what God is trying to do in us and through us. And if we miss it, we may have to go through it again. God, help me. Help me. Help me. 
me. I don't want to miss. I don't know about anybody else. I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss the lesson the first time because it's been tough enough the first time. And I don't want to go through this thing a second time. So God, help me to shift my perspective even though it hurts like hell right now. Even though it's uncomfortable right now, God. Shift my perspective so that I can be able to see this as you see it. Oh, why? Well, because I told you all, I told you all that even in our dark moments, even in our craziest moments, that God is still working behind the scenes. God is working when we're sleeping. God is working when you're crying. God is working when you're worrying. God is working when you're about to pass out. God is working when you're panicking. God is working when you have anxiety. God is working behind the scenes and working things together for your good. So God, help me to shift my location so that my perspective perspective can change so that I can see the hand of God in the midst of everything that's happening around me. But here it is. She says, don't call me that. From this day forward, you call me Naomi, I'm going to punch you in your mouth. She didn't say that. I just wanted to get y'all attention to wake you up. We got, we got violent scenes in here. If I say something about fight, y'all wake up. I'm ready, Pastor. No, ain't nobody trying to fight. So when they get you woke, just want to wake you up. Hallelujah. Just a tactic, preaching tactic one on one. Hallelujah. Don't call me Naomi no more. But call me Mara. It's interesting. It's interesting, y'all. I'm almost done. It's inter- interesting that God shows his sovereign hand. In the midst of this crazy period in her life, by providing her with the right people at the right time, God often answers our prayers by sending the right people at the right time. Often, God provides for us sovereignly by sending the right people at the right time. God oftentimes shows his love for us by sending the right people at the right time. Oftentimes, God shows us how much he cares about us and that we're on his mind when he sends the right people at the right time. It is not by happenstance, it's not by coincidence that o- the Oprah left and that Ruth stayed there with Naomi. No, but they, no, 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 no. It was not by happenstance that Ruth made this lifelong commitment to be with Naomi until she dies and even after she dies. It's not by coincidence. Yeah. That God arranges for this believer by the name of Naomi to come in contact with this pagan worshiper by the name of Ruth to come together and a commitment to be made to do life and community together for the rest of their lives. God is showing Ruth. God is showing Naomi. Though you thought that you have reached the end of your life. I'm sending the right people at the right time to let you know that I have not forgotten about you and that where you have put a period, I've only put a comma because I'm right, I'm working on the next chapter. Oh, oh, God, oh, 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 oh. That where you have put a period, God says I'm putting a comma because there's still more to come from your story. There's still more to come for your life. That though you want to give up, though you want to throw in the towel, the end is not over for you yet, Naomi. And God is not just preaching to Naomi this morning. He's preaching to you over here and you over here and you over here and you over here here and you in the back and you on the parking lot and you walking riding down Jackson Street contemplating about your life. He's sending people the right people at the right time in your life to let you know that it is not over for you. It is not over for you. It is not over for you. I am still right in the next chapter of your life. Oh, God, oh, y'all, y'all, y'all making me work too hard. 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 Y'all making me work too hard.
work too hard. Y'all remember back a few years ago when Everly was born and she went through all of these surgeries and the doctors were saying that she would have limited mobility and all this other stuff. Don't you know that girl that's starting to say words? Don't you know that girl that girl that's starting to take steps? What people thought was a period. God said it's not over because little becomes much in my hands and I am the God of the impossible and I'm still writing. The next chapter of your life. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but let today be your introduction to your resurrection season. Let today be the introduction to your comeback season. That God is still writing your story. It's not over for you yet. God will send the right people to your life. The right time. Why does God, Pastor Swim, send the right people into your life at the right time? God does that. God does it. And when I say right people, I mean that he sends the right people at the right time to speak life into you. Because we have every now and then, listen, this is the purpose of community. This is why we need to be surrounded with other saints and other believers. Because get this, what happens is we need the right people at the right time who will speak words of faith into our hearing. Oh, God, y'all don't want to have church in me? Okay, 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 because y'all don't want to be real. Y'all got y'all church faces on, y'all Labor Day faces and stuff on today. So let's go ahead and just take them off real quick and be real for a moment. There have been moments in my life. I can't talk about y'all. I'll talk about me. There have been moments in my life, Minister Ford, where I have been down. I have been discouraged. It has been dark. And it's been somebody who did not know what was going on because I've come to realize there is a time for me to open up my mouth and share with others my prayer request but there's sometimes I need to keep my mouth shut and just give that stuff to God and when I give that stuff to God God has a way of arranging for a text message to come through God has a way of arranging for an email to come through God has a way of somebody coming up to you and saying something to speak the right words into my life at the right time because sometimes I'm so down sometimes I'm so out that I don't have enough strength to speak faith into my own hearing and God will send somebody else to remind me that that God cares about me, that God loves me, that God is concerned about me, and they speak faith into my hearing. Okay, okay, maybe you haven't gotten there yet, but you keep on living, and you're going to be able to say, Pastor said it, and Pastor was going to be right. There's going to come a moment in your life that you're going to need some help in helping you in the journey, and vice versa. There are people that God put on your mind, and God put on your heart. Stop ignoring it. Send the text message. Send the email. I know it's old school. Make the phone call. Write the letter. Because your act will serve as confirmation to them. God, ain't, it ain't over for me yet. It ain't over, it ain't over, it ain't over, it ain't over, it ain't over. God is still working things together for my good. God is still paving the way. God is still rewriting my story. God is still working things together for my good. Here it is. Naomi says, I'm bitter. But look at verse 22. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. From Bethlehem, leaves Bethlehem because of the famine, loses her husband, loses her son, told her daughters-in-laws, disconnect from me, go on, live your best life, start over. Ruth doesn't leave, she holds on. Ruth encourages her, and they travel back to Bethlehem. Because get this, God, thank you. Because get this, they're returning back to the place where there was no bread. But now God has provided some bread. Yeah, yeah. Woo! She left Bethlehem. 
Bethlehem, Brother Joe, because there was no bread. Went to Moab for a little bit, came back to Bethlehem. Now, where there is bread, get this though, not just bread, but this is the beginning of the barley harvest. So what was planted, God help me today, is now about to be harvested, God. So it was by God's divine plan that he had her go off somewhere because he was working on some things and get some things in place to make sure that when my child shows back at home, I got to make sure that daddy got some food on the table. So he sends her away, sends her away. She deals with some stuff. She goes through some things, but she gets back and she gets back not she gets back just in time for the barley harvest. Gets back in time to be able to reap the benefits, get this, of seeds that were sold that she never sold. God help me. She was getting ready to be blessed by somebody else's hard work and labor that she never did. Here it is. Here it is. This is why. This is why I said. 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 Never forget that God does His best work when it looks hopeless. Never forget that God is working all things together for my good. Never forget that God has a plan and a purpose for your pain. Never forget. That God has a purpose for everything that you have encountered in life. Never forget that God has not forgotten about you. Never forget that he will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. That he will stick closer to you. Here's the last challenge. We're making our way out the door because you got those ribs ready for the grill. Hallelujah. You got two options. You can either stay bitter or you can make the best lemonade ever. You got two options, saints. You can walk around with a na nice, nasty attitude and think that everybody owes you something. You can walk around and be mean and not be in connection with nobody at all. Or you can say, enough is enough. And I made up in my mind that I'm going to make the best lemonade with what I got. Get this, you all. Now, when I talk about making lemonade, I'm not talking about it. I'm not talking about going to Walmart and getting you a bottle of lemon juice and a bag of sugar and a pitcher and, and a spoon. No, 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 no. Deacon Tony Smith from St. John's Praise and Worship Center makes some of the best lemonade you will ever have in your life. Oh, my gosh. You got nothing, nothing, nothing. Whatever place you think has good lemonade has nothing on Deacon Tony's lemonade. On. I asked him the secret of it. I said, Brother Tony, I said, Deacon Tony, I said, man, can I take some of this lemonade? Can I just, can I take this home and just put it next to me in the bed and just look at it because it's so good? I said, how? What bottle of lemonade are you using to make this sanctified Holy Ghost feel lemonade? He said, Brother Pastor, I don't use a bottle of lemon juice. He said, I go and I purchase the lemons and I, and I cut the lemons up and, I'm, and I take the time. He says, there's a lot of work that goes into it, a lot of work that goes into it. And I take the time and I take each lemon and I squeeze the juice. Out of every lemon. And when I think all the juice is gone, I squeeze it again. And then when I think the juice is gone, I squeeze it again to make sure that I've gotten every bit of lemon out of that, every, make sure that I got every bit of lemon juice out of that lemon. And once I do all of that, once I do all of that, I add the sugar and I put the water in there and I stir it. It does not just happen by itself. I have to get a big spoon and stir it all up because I have to be able to get everything that's down there at the bottom. The folks think it's been forgotten. I got to get the sugar down there at the bottom real good to stir it up to get it in there because then I have to taste it as I'm going along because if I don't taste it as I'm going along, it still could be bitter. So I have to add a little bit more sugar or I have to get some more lemons and squeeze the 
the juice out of the lemon. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but the Holy Ghost sent me here to let you know that as much as you've been squeezed, as much as you have been pressed, my gosh, you about to make the best lemon juice you've ever had all year. Oh my goodness. As much as you've been pressed, as much as you've been strained, you are about to become the best lemon juice that Walmart will ever have. Somebody ought to celebrate at the fact that the squeezing has not been in vain. The labor has not been in vain. God's been setting me up. I didn't realize he was setting me up. I didn't like to set up, but God's been setting me up and getting me ready for the best comeback I've ever had in my life. So make up in your mind today that I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not going to be mad. I'm going to make the best lemon juice that has ever been made before. Because what we fail to realize in the life of a believer, the squeezing is necessary. Because without the squeezing, you'll never know how anointed you are. You will never know the power that lies within because of the squeezing. That's being made. Y'all remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and the olive press? He's praying. He's praying. Three times he prays. And he finally settles in and says, God, not my will, but your will be done. Bible says that he sweated so. He sweated so that he sweated drops of blood. There in the Garden of Gethsemane was the making of his anointing. Here in the pews of Hopewell, there in your home, there in your dorm, they're in your car on the way to work. They're in the shower as you're crying. The making of your anointing. Pressed on every side, you said, Pastor, I can't be squeezed no more. Ain't nothing left. <laughs> Ain't nothing left from January up until now. There's nothing left. And when you're making real lemonade with the lemons, when you think there's nothing left, you get that lemon instrument and you put that lemon on top of it and you squeeze it some more. To get the rest of the juice. Once again, since you got two options. You can stay better or you get your lemons get your pitcher get your water get your sugar get your spoon and taste and see that the Lord is good but the choice is yours Dangerous to stay bitter because your, your, your perspective will stay distorted. You will always see what God has done to you and never see what God has ahead of you. God, thank you. If I stay bitter, I'm going to say it again because that was really good. If I stay bitter, dangerous. Because I will always see what the Lord has allowed to happen and never see the beginning of the, of the barley harvest season. Amen. I want to pray with you today. If that's you, you're saying, Pastor, I'm being squeezed. There's nothing left in me. I want you to meet me at this altar. If you feel like giving up and want to throw in the towel, I want you to meet me at this altar. If you're not in a good headspace, I want you to meet me in this, at this altar. Bum rush it, rush a 